Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Inshallah, we'll now begin with our final event in the evening, which will be a joint Q&A session given by Imam Suleiman Hani, Dr. Haifa Yunus, and Dr. Mohanad Aqeem. So uh, I'm just going to go over our plan for Q&A sessions real quick. Um, we'll be passing out note cards and pens to the audience. There should be a stack at every table, and there should also be a pen there. Um, if you'd like, please, please write down Please, please feel free to write down any questions that you may have and um, like whatever you want any of the speakers to answer basically and inshallah we'll have conference staff that will be collecting uh, note cards throughout the entire Q&A session. So inshallah without further ado we may begin. Yes, yes, yes. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa ala rasulillah. I have a question from a young, a very young woman who just approached me and said, please read this question in the question and answer. So she wanted everyone to hear it. And I'm so glad she had the courage to write it and to ask to be read in public. I am from a Muslim country. And my parents are Muslims. And my parents are Muslims too. I want to wear hijab and be covered but my parents don't want me to do though. What should I do? I'll read it again because I wanted to pierce your heart. I'm from a Muslim country. This is a 17, 16. I don't think she is older than that. I'm from a Muslim country and my parents are Muslim and I want to wear hijab and my parents does not want me to do that. Subhanallah, this is a real phenomena. This is real. This is not a one case. You hear it every now and then. This you see it in, unfortunately, a lot of our Muslim community, where you see the youth. We all complain about the youth. The number one issue that we complain about and is like we are losing our youth. Our youth are not connected with Allah. Our youth are distracted. Here you go. That's a youth, a she, who wants to do the most difficult decision. Any woman will do. And those of you who wear hijab, you know what I'm talking about. I would love to talk to the parents afterward in private, if you are in the audience, so we don't expose people. But I want them to ask themselves these two questions. Why don't you want her to do that? What you will tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, when he will ask you, and he said, why did you be in her path to obey me? Hijab is an obligation, my brothers and sisters. Call it what you want to call it. Get excuses what you want to do. But it's fact. It's there. It's in the Quran. It's in the Sunnah. It is there. Why don't I want this young soul, beautiful heart, to grow up with the obedience of Allah? What will she lose if she had her hijab on? When are we going to be moving pass this feeling that if I am a practicing Muslim, then I am not be able to achieve. And if I can ask anyone in this room, especially the sisters, I can, some I know you very well, those of you who don't know me, I'm a practicing obstetrician and gynecologist. I, and I hate the word I, but I need the parents to hear this. And I trained before September 11, and when September 11, I was in training. The only Muslim, they've never seen a hijabi woman before. They even, they used to look at me and say, what's your religion? Right? Well, honestly, are you a nun? Exactly. Right? Nothing happened. Trained in the best, the fifth medical school in the U.S. And it did not stop because I was wearing hijab. And the final was me and another blonde woman. And everyone was telling me, they will not take you. This is, I heard this from Muslims. They said they will not take you because OBGYN at that time was extremely competitive. And, and I said that nobody will give it to me except Allah. If he wants to give it to me, he will give it to me. And the rest is history. No, a'udhu billah. No, I'm not doing I need the parents to hear this. Don't compromise your deen for dunya. Do you think she will not get accepted to Harvard? Do you want me to show you the picture of people I know they finished Harvard? Woman, beautiful. 
Even in the Biden administration, there is a woman who wears hijab and a proper full hijab. Some of you may have seen it, seen her. She's from, uh, originally from Pakistan. What is the issue? Why not? Why do I allow my daughter, and I'm speaking, you can feel me, with a lot of passion and sadness. Why do I allow my daughters to be on the beach and to be in the clubs, and I have no problem with that? And then when this young heart wants to obey Allah, you come to parents and say no? And I will say this last word because I don't want to take the... And I say you better have a very good answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are standing in front of him, and he will ask you, وَكُلُّهُمْ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدَ Everyone will come to Allah as an individual. So please say yes and help her. And I will give my phone number to this girl and to keep her strong. And I will say to her, do it. Even if your parents said no. And Allah will never let you down. Jazakumullah <laughs> khairan. Quick comment. I was sharing with Imam Suleiman this morning, and he didn't know that, although we know each other, alhamdulillah, for a long time. So my wife, is, she has three sisters, and the four, the four girls in the family did not wear the hijab in their teenage years. My wife chose to wear the hijab at the age of 19 or 20, and even her mom, who was a hijabi herself, resisted the idea of her wearing the hijab. And the idea was, nobody will marry you. That's some weird culture back there in Lebanon. And guess what? Six months after wearing her hijab, she married me. <laughs> Not sure that's good or bad. Maybe that's a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the idea is, imagine the, 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 the false misconception, just one idea that you won't be attractive enough, that nobody would look at you. There's so much internalized, I would say, self-hate towards or uh, dissociation from, from Muslim principles that could penetrate our Muslim cultures. And just being back home or in a Muslim country does not make you you know, immune from that. And uh, subhanAllah, our parents are also humans like us, and they have their own issues and struggles. There's a lot to, to talk about this, but again, I will be here for all night. I know the session is very limited, but there's, inshallah, we can always take one-on-one -on -one questions. I have a question right here. I'll just go ahead and read it. Um, as a student, is it okay to miss Salah and make it up when I am done with studying slash class, or should I get out of class and fulfill Salah by all possible means. This is, a, this is a common problem with US students, especially in high school. Jazak. Barakallahu feekum. When it comes to, and it is a common question, subhanAllah, when it comes to prayer, first of all, we were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? We were created to worship him in the manner that he commanded. And the first thing that will, will be asked about on the Day of Judgment is salah. Final advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam amongst other advices, as salah, as salah, the prayer, the prayer. Uh, however, of course, living in a country in which there's a certain type of system in terms of times and schedules and things like that, it's a common question that arises, whether at the workplace, whether you're traveling, whether you're studying, it'll arise in different forms and we need to just understand a few essential things and then stick to them inshallah ta'ala consistently. The first is that out of his mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us uh, an extensive amount of time to pray each prayer, right? You're not required to literally pray in the minute that the adhan comes in if you are not able to. You have two or three hours sometimes, depending on the time of the year, to finish that salah. The second thing is that if you really are unable to, meaning you have, let's say, a three-hour class, and you're going from Vuhr all the way to Asr, for example, and it's not a situation in which you believe you can combine, so what do you do in that case? If salah means that much to you, you can request from your professor. I'm sure many of you have done this before. I have had to do this so many times. I need to step out for five minutes to pray. I have a limited time. It's a religious obligation. I'll come back and I'll collect the notes from my classmates and continue from there. You can do that inshallah ta'ala. The question is, do we value salah enough to do that? Do we know its significance, its importance? Do we also know that, it, number one, it's a form of da'wah to other people and that we've had many students and many professors over the years learn about Islam from students who used to leave the class for salah and come back. When they would come to the masjid, one of the first things we ask is, how did you learn about Islam? Why do you want to become Muslim? Some of those faculty members and students would tell us, I used to see my students or classmates leave consistently for prayer, and I wanted to know what this was that made someone so principled that God was more important to them than their class. And they would become Muslim from the, from the, the example of the student who never knew about that. 
So you don't know the effect in terms of da'wah. Number two, even if there isn't a direct effect on somebody else, at the end of the day, you will find more barakah in your studies, in your work, in everything else that you do, because you're leaving the thing that, yes, has some worldly importance. You're going to something of greater priority. When you come back, you'll find more barakah in it, inshallah ta'ala. I just advise everyone, generally, when you do take breaks uh, or you ask for a leave, whether it's at the workplace or uh, your studies, make sure that you are generally a person of ihsan so they don't think, what, you're lazy, you don't do your work, and now you want to leave for five minutes to pray. No. I'm the hardest working student, and I'm going to leave for five minutes and still do the best that I can in this class. And of course, at the end of the day, we know that if you really cannot, because of an emergency, because of something outside of your control, uh, let's say you have a three-hour uh, or four-hour board exams or something else, and it goes from Dhuhr to Asr, and you really cannot take a break. If you really cannot take a break in that context, sometimes on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, you can ask a scholar to first get uh, permission to do this, then in some cases you can combine Dhuhr with Asr, Asr time or at Dhuhr time and Maghrib and Isha, depending on the situation. But we can't just take that as a default and do it whenever we want. We're supposed to ask to make sure that our case uh, is exempt and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us for being consistent in Salah. Allahumma ameen. Uh, we have another question here. Um, how can we deal with on a person-to-person -person basis with a family refusing to let two Muslims marry because they are not the same ethnicity as you? I'm just going to comment the same comment. I don't know if you heard the question. So two Muslims, and I'm assuming they are two young Muslim, a man and a woman, wants to marry, and the parents say no because they are not the same ethnicity, background. And I'm not surprised because if you go to the Horizon magazine and you look at the matrimonial and look at the request, it tells you a lot. It tells you a lot of that. The answer is, I will say one word and I leave the rest. Ibadillah taqullah. Servants of Allah have taqwa of Allah. Help people to practice their deen. And don't be the obstacle. There are so many obstacles outside for all these young people. And you know it all. All of you know what are we facing as Muslims. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about us internally with all the temptations and all the things. And now you come as a Muslim and become another obstacle. That's going to be very hard. Alayhi salatu We'll move on to our next question. Inshallah, I am confident that I can fast during Ramadan. However, because of my pregnancy, my husband is worrying and asking me not to fast. How should I react to this? Thank you. <laughs> this is by default. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so pregnancy and fasting, scholars differ. As Do you look at it as, like Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas basically said, she is like, she is like somebody who cannot fast, and then she doesn't. And some people say it's according to the ability. This is what I tell my patients. You divide it according to three things. Is she a healthy pregnancy, healthy woman, and a healthy baby? The answer is try. I never say don't, and I never say yes, for sure you can. People are different. And even if it's a completely healthy pregnancy, people are different. And I say, listen, it's a rukhsa from Allah. It's a permission. Try it. And see, if there is any possibility of difficulty, I'm not talking about harm, I'm talking about difficulty, she gets dizzy, she cannot function, then you know what? Take the rukhsa, take the permission. In Allah, yuhibbu an tu'ta rukhsa kama yuhibbu an tu'ta azaima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that we, Muslims, take the permissions, like fasting, not fasting and travel, the same way he likes us to take his orders and obligations. So that's the case if she's completely healthy. If she is not healthy, there's a complication, high-risk pregnancy, case by case. There is few cases where I said, nope, you cannot fast. For example, if she's vomiting all the time. For example, if it's a, we call it IUGR, the baby is very small, it's not growing, she's not gaining weight. And if she starts fasting and starts losing weight, that's when she stops fasting. So it's case by case, but it's not categorically yes, and it's not categorically no. Our next question is, um, 
how do we as teenagers and young adults men slash better our relationship with our parents? It's hard these days with our parents as we have different opinions and goals. Jazakumullah khairan. Okay, so me being a parent of four children, the oldest is 14, youngest is five. I'll try to answer this, but again, you can benefit a lot from. So, uh, subhanAllah, how can we better our relationship with our parents? First, understand that you are a test to your parents and they are the test to you. Understand your parents have not figured it out. They are in this life. They have more experience. Allah tells the parents, These kids are your biggest test in life. And some of the, so realize that Allah is testing them through you. And realize that one of you, the, 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 uh, as the Prophet Muhammad says, that the parent is the, 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 the most important door and gateway to paradise. So there is, if you can dissect this problem a little bit, first of all, they are a priority after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if your parents are telling you not to wear hijab, for example, the example that was mentioned, this is, Allah comes first. But after Allah and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes a wide spectrum of choices, uh, things to do, things not to do, how you spend your weekends, what kind of school do you go to, what kind of major. There's so many things going on that your parents may or may not give you the right command or obligation. And I'm struggling with this myself since now I have, alhamdulillah, my dad is still around and my son is 14. So I'm in between, I'm stuck in between these two, like two, 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 two uh, generations or ages. So first, there are, there are ways that you can always negotiate. So your parents cannot enforce a marriage on you, right? They, there's no way they can do that. And if, but if, the, if your parents have objections to marriage due to other reasons other than the ethnicity, for example, or the background or whatever, then this is where you try to dig a little bit deeper and understand, um, are you opposing them just because you want to be different, you are deferring them, you are challenging them, or do they have valid reasons? FYI, your parents know a lot about you. I, I went through a lot of, uh, I wouldn't call midlife crisis, but you know, after crossing the age of 40, I, I was thinking about, okay, what am I doing with, with my life? And I tried to journal a lot, and some friends, Allah is al khair, were a major part of the help in the process. And guess what? I figured out through a lot of journaling, uh, journaling and reflections that my parents, my parents were right on so many things. I hate to admit it, like most rebellious kids, no, no, I, we think that we have all the answers. Our parents know a lot about us, and they care about us more than anyone else. Sometimes they don't know how to express it. Sometimes, out of love, they might give us not the, the best advice, but bear, bear that in mind. So, uh, and and, and the, the other thing is always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the closed heart and make ways for any difficult situation. I have numerous examples of Dr. Haifa about you know, a young couple who wanted to get married, you know, different ethnicities, and the parents w refused for the silliest of reasons, I'll be honest, and you know, awkward answers. And the guys kept on making dua, يعني, sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After two years, one weekend, subhanAllah, his mom, his her, her, subhanAllah, Allah is the one who flips and changes the heart. So through dua, through consistency, through a lot of deep reflection, he was asking himself, is that, is my parents' refusal a sign from Allah that this person is not good for me? And the objective answer was no. There's no good reasons why this marriage is not going forward. And alhamdulillah, they are now happily married with two kids. And now his wife and his mom are like best friends. You know, alhamdulillah, يعني, uh, يعني it's never a linear answer. Everyone has a story. And uh, subhanAllah, it, it's a case by case. But again, we can speak for hours on how we can open the relationship. Sometimes you're, you need to, 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 uh, to maybe make use of quality moments. I, I, for me, quality times are when we are driving. Maybe try to take your dad or mom on a road trip where they are stuck with you for hours. And no, no cell phone, no audio, no even Quran. Just you are stuck to talk. And they are, because you are not, maybe because you're not talking to each other, not facing each other, this could be a very good quality time. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used his time with Abdullah bin Abbas on his back to teach him amazing words. Ya ghulam, inni u'alimuka kalimat. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used these teaching moments when he was alone with Abdullah bin Abbas and others on a ride. Wallahu alam. How can we convince the youth that it's haram to use bad words just to fit in with the other students? Mm. 
do they really need to be convinced or do they already know? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was describing some of the people who would face punishments in the next life. And we usually think of what the major sins is like, oh, this person drinks, alcohol intoxication, and other major sins amongst the people mentioned in a report recorded by Imam Muslim was the one who was commonly using obscene language, the one who uses profane language. Your language, your words, your speech, your writing matters. And it's not just verbal, it's also text, it's also online, it's also on social media. Be careful, be careful, be careful with your language. In terms of wanting to fit in, I would just remind the one who asked this question, may Allah bless you, you probably won't be thinking about the people you're trying to get validation from in five or ten years. They, they'll be insignificant to you. But you will remember having to give in to that feeling that you want to be accepted as cool or you want validation from people who really, if you think about it, uh, are indirectly pressuring you to do something or say something that displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the end, what's lasting? What stays with you? You, know, you have deeds that will last with you. You have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ever-living, forever. And then you have people, whether it's friends, community members, even family. If they pressure you to do something bad, at the end of the day, all people will die. And you won't take any hasanat from people. You're not going to be getting, meaning, the reward or the sin from that individual. At the end of the day, it's you and your deeds with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember that. And in addition to this, I'll be very honest, this is my opinion. It's not cool to cuss. Like, it's not a cool thing. I don't know who ever said it was cool. Even in middle school and high school, like, the kids we heard cussing, we thought they were pretty, uh, sorry for using the word, like, dumb. Why? Because they couldn't express things at all without cussing. Like, come on, man, the English language has so many other words. Do you have to use profane language to express what you have to say? It's not cool. And in fact, there is a shift, and it is trending uh, in some places, some segments of society, for people to be a little more cautious with their words and to be a little wiser and more thoughtful. Lastly, if that was the last conversation you had in which you used profanity, would you be happy with that? There have been many people who died old and young. We had a janaza just last year with three people, a 13-year-old and maybe a 20 or 25-year-old and a, a grandfather in his 60s. So there's no discrimination when it comes to age, right? You don't want your last conversations, your last habits to be things that were displeasing to Allah, even if it was cool to some individuals. Who are they at the end of the day? You're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always focus on that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our language in person and online. Allahumma amin. We'll now, moving, we'll now be moving on to our next question. How do I raise a, ch a Muslim child in this non-Islamic state? I am very much afraid about this. Children see the Christmas festival but not Eid. How can I teach him slash her in that Eid is the most enjoyable festival for us? JazakAllah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so basically the question is, in a non-Islamic, and I will add, and please forgive me, even in the Muslim countries these days. If you go to Muslim countries, and I'm talking, I lived there, I'm not saying this, and I lived there not a long time ago when I studied. Uh, absolutely, and Valentine's Day, and then, uh, um, it's not coming to me. No, actually, the, the, the last, uh, the, in October, what is the name of the... Halloween, exactly, yeah, which is, anyway. So, Rasulullah you all probably know the meaning of the hadith, I don't recall exactly, but the meaning of, there will come a time where if you see the, the Jews and the Christians go into a small hall in the wall, you will follow. So this is natural. You know, when we ever look at problems, let's first accept it. Meaning, doesn't mean accept, it's okay. But it's there, don't brush it. That's number one. And is it nice and cool? Come on in. I mean, you walk in, the, in, in, Chris, in December and you see all these beautiful homes and they are all with beautiful lights and then the tree and then the, and everybody's talking about it. Right. If I have not engraved in my child from the age of four and five and six, the identity of a Muslim, it's not going to happen when he is 15 and 16. These things to be different, and I said this when we talked to you, the uh, sisters, you need to engrave in your child when he's two and three and four. I always say this to the mothers. Your three and four-year-old or your seven and eight cannot wear anything 
Because when she becomes a baligh, an adult, it's not a switch and you will turn it off. And tomorrow you expect her to, to dress completely modest. It's not going to happen. This has to come from the beginning. Before that, you need as parents to have this in, in you, that you are strong in your faith and you are proud of who you are. And you see it, which I really find it extremely astonishing. You see the Jews, and I work with a lot of Jews, they do not worry about the Christmas at all. And everybody knows. How do I know? Because who works in the Christmas day? It's either the Muslims or the Jews. Why we Muslims have this problem? This is my, my question to everybody. I think we need to be comfortable, as I said it before, in our skin and who we are. Faddalna, Allah has chose us. And why do you want to be like everybody else? Having said that, you need to give uh, an alternative. You need to make Eid the most celebrated. Gifts, cakes, everything, and even decorate. I have friends who decorate their homes exactly the same because it's an, a sign of celebration. And I am, in my religion, doesn't tell me don't celebrate but tells me celebrate one, two, and three, and four. And I will celebrate one, two, and three, and four. And a lot of dua, a lot of dua. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Okay, I'm gonna be the blunt guy. Sister, hey, Dr. Haifa's answer was a little bit politically correct. I'm gonna be very blunt. Parents, don't work on Eid. Take the time off, not two hours. And then go back to your work. I understand that you're single, you don't have family. I understand you take time for Eid off and then you go back to your work. Maybe I might accept, although you need to take the means necessary to enjoy Eid. To let your family feel and think that this is big and important to you. Number two, on Eid, try to smile. Be happy. Go to an expensive restaurant. Now, I will be honest, I am a cheap Arab dad who tries to cut the best deal ever, but not on Eid. Go to a decent, better restaurant. Let's go to that Kit Kerry and don't look on Groupon for 50% off. Go and pay more money. I'm serious, right? Because if, if our kids don't see that we are valuing this and prioritizing what Allah prioritizes, then guess what? They will understand. And if you are buying something, let's say you're, getting, you're shopping for a laptop, and we all know that Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, deals are better than other deals. It's okay to miss on that good deal on Christmas and buy it on Eid al-Fitr or Eid al-Adha. I know it's more money. It goes counter to how we are wired and we think, especially Arab dads like me. But please, I mean, parents have to understand that you value this so much. I've, 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 I've had many conversations with, with masjid owners, imams, board members. They see how يعني, some people are not willing to take the day off because the Eid is on a Tuesday and they just have to go back to work. Yaqi, what's happening? What's happening? What, what is our priorities? And then we ask ourselves, oh, our kids don't value Eid enough. They value Christmas more. Because they, they see it. There's a, whole week, there's a whole week off between Christmas and New Year. By the way, I was talking to, I had a Christian colleague one time and he, uh, we were talking about when are we taking that time off I was telling me, oh, my Christmas and New Year are on the same day. I was like, oh, you're right. There's one week exactly, one week apart. I'll, I'll be honest. I didn't notice this very obvious fact to some of you. Maybe because I'm, good, I'm bad in math, although I'm an engineer. But, I, I mean, this is how my parents made uh, the Christmas and the New Year become very insignificant. Jazakumullah khair. And they tried their best to make Eid special. So it takes us going out of our ways and thinking differently and making sure that everyone is waiting for Eid. For, for in, in my house, we try to make the Eid Yawm al jaiza Where if you fast, you know, many parents have this. They have their kids count how many days they fasted. And it's kind of the, the, whatever your kids are wishing for, there's one time in the year where you can order it. This is Eid. So I understand there's a lot of influence from the media, from high schools, from friends. But at least if your son, if your kids are in elementary, middle school, you do have, you can turn a lot of these knobs yourself. Sorry for being blunt. But this is out of love. Tough love. You guys got the trio for this one. You get three responses, inshallah. May Allah bless you. Look what you did, asking about Christmas and other things. I just want to add, there's not much more to add to this. Uh, I grew up, alhamdulillah, and I, I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that uh, generally never really struggled with the issue of Christmas or Halloween. 
And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my parents from a very young age taught us why it was problematic uh, and what was wrong with it and who we are as Muslims. So despite the fact that, yes, we are living in the U.S. and I grew up here pretty much my entire life, I never really felt like I was missing anything on those days. And I think a part of it is because, unlike some of the friends that I had, uh, my parents were consistent throughout the year in teaching us who we were. And it wasn't just, hey, be Muslim, pray, stay away from certain things, do certain things. And then when you ask about Christmas and Halloween, no, that's haram, right? So there was like a consistent building of who we were and a development in terms of terbiyah that when it came to these matters, they told us why as well. Sometimes kids just want to know why it's wrong. What's the big deal? And so it seems insignificant to the parent because you know best, but they might not understand that. So explaining that consistently and not just when those occasions come up, I think is important. Uh, in addition to that, uh, everyone has a different uh, experience with this, but I think celebrating other things is also important. So for a lot of, for example, young girls when they wear hijab, make a hijab party in a gathering. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a, you're not making this like some kind of religious innovation or anything like that. You're celebrating something very important. Your child memorizes a surah of the Quran, celebrate it for them, bring some friends, inspire them to memorize Quran. So find occasions to celebrate that are all associated with something good, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with uh, their own accomplishments, with their own milestones, so that when these small things come up here and there throughout the year, they already know that they're problematic, the expectations are set, and the tarbiyah and the aqidah is there uh, in advance. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all with a lot of occasions and celebrations for his sake throughout the year, so that our children are not feeling like they're missing out on something that is not just prohibited, but in fact harmful for them and harmful for society. Wallahu alam. So next week, inshallah, this time, my, my daughter Jannah will be 10 years old, bidnillah. And this is our celebration party. Yes, that's a joke, yeah. Celebration. So she's 10, so technically we have to command her for salat and we have to force her for salat. So she understands this and she takes it in a very light way and humorous way. Oh, it's my celebration party. So Jannah, from now on, from next week on, you are 10, so you are kind of responsible for salat and will hold you more accountable for it. And hey, there's a party, there's cakes, there's all kinds of fancy stuff. So Jazakallah khair, Imam Sulaiman. This is our next question. Um, could you elaborate specifically on the Islamic worldviews on controversial topics like feminism, sexuality, racism, war, etc.? Jazakumullah khairan. Wait, you want me to elaborate on seven different topics? <laughs> Uh, can we talk about this later? Okay, so uh, I don't know where to begin because essentially the topic that I had set the foundations for it, right? Understanding that, first of all, there is some, something called a worldview. And everyone has a worldview, even if they seem neutral, agnostic, atheist, anything else. Everyone has a set of beliefs about everything. Whether it's the way that they carry themselves or what is justice and injustice, what is oppression, what is evil, what is good, how do you govern, how do you live, what is your purpose, uh, do you believe in God? Everyone has a worldview. So what I was getting at was first understanding what your worldview is, making sure we have a solid foundation that is intellectually justified, that we, uh, for example, study proofs of prophethood, dala'il nubuwa. You can find so many amazing resources online. One of the most, alhamdulillah, influential, especially in the English language in recent years, was the one by uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Shinnawi. You can find it on Yaqeen Institute's website. It's helped so many people learn about Islam, and it's helped many Muslims be convinced of their foundation in Islam. And it's paired up with one other topic, which is I'jaz al-Qur'an, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. These two topics serve as a foundation for why Islam is the truth. And it's something we have to articulate very clearly, but if we can't, we need to go back to these two topics, inshallah ta'ala. The miraculous nature of the Qur'an, the proofs of prophethood will help you to understand why the Islamic worldview is true. And here, we mean objectively true. Thereafter, Everything we study of the topics that came up and, of course, the references that we made to anything from racism to uh, rights to justice to social justice issues to governance, we look at through the lens of Islam. What does that mean? We go back to the scholars who understand those topics, who have studied them for many years and also are grounded in Islamic theology and uh, philosophy and will understand these topics uh, a little better each time, inshallah ta'ala, and will be able to address the issues that we see in society, knowing that it's guided uh, activism, it's guided by that which is divine, rather than working the other way around, finding a problem in society, 
and addressing it and possibly making mistakes along the way or in addition to that finding that we are influenced negatively by something that has an anti-Islamic value buried within it or something that for those who know is a little more obvious of secularism and liberalism and many other uh, isms that we cover today but I, I can't really comment on all the things that you referenced in your question may Allah bless you I would say start with building the foundation for yourself and then go to the scholars who are trustworthy you'll find a lot of alhamdulillah authentic resources these days through reputable institutes, uh, organizations, and councils, and individuals, and then look at their commentary on these issues. Engage with the academic works that they publish, and not just the quick, you know, uh, Instagram post or tweet that's very short and does not give you a lot of context about worldviews. I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to grant us all beneficial knowledge. Well, I mean. Jazakumullah khairan. Okay, so our next question is, um, what should I do or what should one do in cases when a Muslimah needs to see a doctor in an emergency and there is no female doctor? An example would be during giving birth or other cases. That's an easy one. That's an easy one, alhamdulillah. <laughs> Not controversial. I mean, this, scholars have covered this. You need to know this basics in, uh, in, in fiqh. Necessity makes hal haram halal. So anytime I'm in a situation, and the necessity means necessity. I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat it and color it, but necessity. So here I am going, for example, coming to labor and delivery. Like there's certain places where you don't have a physician. Or let's say you came in here to... Um, Colombia and then you're pregnant and guess what you ended up with having labor and then you go up show to labor and delivery and the on-call person is a, as a man that's it because if you're not going to see the man what's going to happen you're going to end up they will not let you in the in the hospital you have to sign and they have to leave and then you will probably deliver somewhere else and that's you're exposing yourself to danger and the baby to danger so this applies there's a case of necessity it's not a choice I don't have another option and that's it. And then I can explain to that to them, and I have seen it in throughout all my career. If you really explain that as much as, yani the, in delivery, of course, there's issues, but again, respecting your privacy res as much as possible. But anytime there is a necessity, for example, my Muslim patients, and I say, even in the office, I tell her, if you're going to need, if you want a epidural, I cannot guarantee you a, a, a woman because that's a schedule I have no control over it. However, and I explained this to her, I will talk to them that they cover you as much as possible, only the area that they need. But learn, this is the beauty of Islam, that there's always solutions for, for cases. And may Allah make it easy for everyone. Jazakumullah khairan. So, there's actually two questions that are related. I'm trying, uh, how much time do we have? Two minutes? 20? Oh, we have time. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So there's two questions, Dr. Haifa, related to uh, the, the dress code for Muslims. One is related to men or male dressing code. What's ru the ruling for male dressings? Do we have permission to cover the ankle by our pants? That's one dress code question. The other one is deeper, and it's related to hijab. Can we explain why we're wearing hijab? When I get asked, I cannot answer. I'm wearing hijab because I'm told to by Allah. Sometimes I feel, yes, I understand. Why we should wear mo modest, but why cover hair? And yeah, specifically the hair. And I think, subhanAllah, that's... <laughs> You're good, man. Are you a lawyer by any chance? <laughs> okay, bismillah. So the ruling for for the male, male dressing code is at the issue of the ankle. You want to comment on this quickly? Pass it on to me. You're the lawyer, mashallah. In terms of the, uh, the issue of isbal, for men, for, for pants to be basically below the ankles, the issue of isbal, a difference of opinion amongst the scholars of the form of that in the early generations, it was known that without any difference of opinion whatsoever, there was agreement that if you wear your clothes to show off or look down on other people or with arrogance towards other people, it is haram. This is something they all agreed on. And in fact, this is what they understood from, many, from the many narrations about the uh, man who basically has his uh, pants going below the ankles. At the time, it was a sign of showing off that you were uh, rich, that you were prideful, and so on and so forth. 
and it wasn't just pants, but in general, the issue of dragging one's clothes. In addition, we say, as the scholars of the four madahib said, that if the one who wears, uh, let's say, pants, and it's on the ankles or below the ankles, is not doing so out of pride, is not arrogant with their clothes whatsoever, and it is the norms of their culture and their society, then it is not haram, and some scholars say it's not even makru, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's mubah. So it depends on, first, the madhab that one follows, but the overwhelming majority of scholars, this is the majority opinion, is that it is not prohibited. It is not prohibited, it is not prohibited, with the exception, of course, as long as you're not being arrogant and prideful. In that case, according to all scholars, wearing any clothes, even if it's just a brand name shirt, to show off and look down on others is prohibited. May Allah protect us from pride. Jazakumullah khair. So the question of hijab, the fact the question is asked, I'm really happy. Because if I want to read it again, can you explain why we are wearing hijab? So immediately come to your mind, this is a, probably a woman who is not, but she said, no, when I get asked, I can't answer, I am wearing hijab, because I'm told by Allah. This statement, it needs to be framed. And then she said, sometimes I feel, yes, I understand, but why should we wear modest, and why I need to cover the hair, um, specifically the hair? So let's start by the, the beginning. We as Muslims, and, and I really appreciate what uh, Sheikh Suleiman has been saying and uh, Dr. Hakim is saying, is basically we need to go to literally to the basics. I always say this to myself before anyone. Why I am here on this earth? This is the first question. Why did he put us here? What does he want from me where I am going? So why I am here, right, as a human being, worship Allah, loves Allah, knows Allah, you all know this. So come to the hijab. Number one, he told me. This is the first line. He said so. قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا They said we hear and we obey. And all of us, men and women, brothers and sisters, we need to get to this point where the first reason is because he told me. And who is he? Who is he needs a whole lecture, a whole conference. Is not anybody else. Is not my friend. Is not my neighbor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My creator, my beloved, the one who gave me everything, the one who sees me, the one who I beg him when I need something, the one who I'm going to stand in front of him, let alone the one who will decide where I'm going at the end. So that's number one. Number two, come, you put it in your question, the modesty. I call Islam, of course I have to bring things from my profession, is a religion of prevention. It's not a religion of treatment, meaning, in medicine, why did we get the, va the, the COVID vaccine? So we can be here today and we are not wearing masks. That's prevention. Otherwise, we're going to be still, Allah knows for how long. Islam looks at society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows us, knows what we have. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah, when he created us, give, gave us the ability or not the inclination to do good and to do bad. He knows what our inclination will be. What's the prevention? We need Allah want when he looks at us, he wants this earth, his creations, to live in decency, to live with a moral conduct, to live in the way to please him, to live to flourish this earth, coming to the hijab. Look at the opposite. And I don't have to explain. Look at society around us, where the hijab is even not there. Modesty is not there. Again, I'm in the professional world, and I see it every day. Where are we ending? Where are we ending? Right? And look at the time of Rasul, right? For 10 years, if not 13 years, there's only two recorded cases, if not a three, of and again, la haya afiddin, of intimate relationship outside marriage. Isn't that amazing? This is a human beings. They are the same. Because they had the, the morality in them, and they know Allah said no, and all the beginnings and at the end. As Rasulullah said, al aynu tazni, wal udnu tazni, that the eyes commit zina. And the ear commit prevention. Part of the prevention is the dress code of the woman. The dress code of the woman. Allah created us in a way that the woman is beautiful and the men get attracted to the woman. That's natural. That's his creation. To, to save 
the earth so we can have children and continue. And at the same time, he said, don't show it except in the proper channels. That's basically what it is. Hijab is to cover the hair because it's one of the most beautiful parts of the woman. Cover. I always ask, what will you lose when you cover your hair? What will you lose? Wallahi nothing. If anything, respect. Wallah Respect. They, all, they look at you as a woman. They look at you as a human being. They respect you more. And why not? Why not? I think we need to a little bit take time, pull back, don't be influenced by what you are seeing, all the junk that they're outside. And just think of it. And enough it, Allah told me, I'm pleasing him, it's protecting me, I am being more respected. I can tell you stories from now till tomorrow morning. Just do it, modest protection, save humanity and save morality. How would you explain to a non-religious person the importance of having rules and morals outside of the laws of one's country from a higher being who knows all? In addition to the, all the, uh, to be honest, I would simply record Imam Suleiman's lecture this morning about Islam, Muslims' worldview, because it really summarizes a lot of the, uh, of, of our justification. Again, we have a lens that we see the word is, this morality uh, measuring stick, that if we leave it up to the people, people will have different uh, justifications, people will have their own standards of what's right and what's wrong. In my simple terms, it's, it's very similar to everyone has their own speed limit. You see that speed limit of 70 miles per hour? But no, no, for me it's 100 miles per hour because I know what I'm doing. It's like somebody saying, I know that te texting and driving is safe for me because I have figured it out. And maybe you have figured it out for 99% of the cases. But guess what? It's the 1% of the case that we have to protect. So at the end of the day, there should be a higher authority, a higher power who sets the rules and standards. For us, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have the solid proof that he is our creator. And Allah says in the Quran, أَلَا يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقَ that he that does not he know the one who created and he is the one who's subtle and he is, has experience and full knowledge about his creation. So for us, um, we, we submit because Islam is all about submission after acceptance and, and understanding that Allah is our creator and proving that this word and these commands are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other question is, what is your word view, as Imam Suleiman mentioned this morning? What is your frame of reference? What is your measuring stick that you measure uh, morality? At the end of the day, people will always have different answers. And these answers sometimes are scary. Because again, back to the Russia example in Ukraine and this war, you know, that everyone is scared from happening. Who is, what is the moral standard of those who are making the choices to engage a war or start a war or stop a war? Unfortunately, it's all Relative. It's all based on hawa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that people who don't follow a religion or a divine message, technically they end up following their own desires and temptations, which is something that's for us as Muslims very worrisome. Wallahu alam. So that's my kind of layman's answer. And of course, I refer people to more organized and structured answers. Wallahu alam. Yes, sir. It was a complete answer, alhamdulillah. I don't want to add uh, anything except I noticed the second part of the question asked about uh, despite the fact that you're living in a land in which there are laws and so on and so forth, um, it seems like maybe the one who asked you this question to the person who asked us, maybe the one who's asking this question misunderstands what it is that we believe because governance, the idea of law of the land and governance is one small part of morality in what we believe in, right? So it doesn't contradict the fact that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that suddenly law of the land has anything to do with that or is affected by that. Because part of our beliefs as Muslims is to follow the law of the land. There's no contradiction between the two. And in fact, everyone, regardless of what they claim to believe, has a moral belief about a creator. Whether they believe or disbelieve, they have a stance on that. They have a stance on morality, what is good and what is evil. How do you govern society without morality? 
How do you pass laws? How do you have politicians advocating for economic equality versus inequality or having a college you know, tuition free and having interest? All of these issues are moral issues. So our belief in God, which in fact is the overwhelming belief of human beings throughout history, until the last hundred years or so, some segments of society have, start, society have started to change, is in fact the default belief of human beings. And as many psychologists, non-Muslims as well, have stated, in fact, it is a fitri belief. It is something that is innate within us to believe in God. And this is according to a number of many studies around the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us clarity on these issues because it will help us to help other people as well. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khairan. I'm a nurse and patients die in my hands and I pray and hold their hands until they take their last breath. Is it haram to do that if they are not Muslims? Jazakallah khairan. So the question is a non-Muslim patient is dying and you held his or her hand and make a dua for them. So can we make a dua for a non-Muslim? Start from the basics. Can we do or not? The answer is yes, except al-maghfirah. If they passed away and they are non-Muslims, we cannot ask Allah to forgive them because Allah said it in the Quran. وَمَا كَانَ اسْتِغْفَارُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ إِلَّا عَنْ مَوْعِدَةٍ وَعَدَهُ إِيَّا فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ أَنَّهُ عَدُوٌّ لِلَّهِ تَبَرَّأَ مِنْ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَأَوَّاهٌ حَلِيمٌ مُنِيبٌ It's Allah explained in this verse that Sayyidina Ibrahim asked forgiveness for his father. But then when he knew his father was an enemy to Allah, meaning a non-Muslim, after he died, تَبَرَّأَ مِنْ He did not do this anymore. So can I make a dua to a non-Muslim? My answer, please make a dua for every non-Muslim you see that Allah guide them. And I really mean it. Every non-Muslim around you is a potential Muslim. Sayyidina Umar was kafir. And look what happened. All the Sahaba were kuffar. So absolutely. Now what's you going to make the dua for that person? Ya Allah, ar-rahma wa rahmati wa si'at. Kulla shay. Allah said that. My rahma engulf everything. Yes. Ya Allah, make it easy for them. Ya Allah, not taqha shahada. If I was there, I'll ask this person to say it after me. You never know. And through you, Allah saved a, a, a soul from the hellfire, like a Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, with a young Jewish man, when he finally said, his father told him, say after Abu al-Qasim, say what he is saying. And he said, alhamdulillah, the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, the word me, alhamdulillah that he enabled me to save a soul from the hellfire. So absolutely there is, don't be too strict. I, this is, I'm finding some questions are very, don't do that. Don't do that. Always be a key for khair. Always be a key of goodness. Don't look at the people around us and they are less than us. A'udhu billah. You don't know when, how they will die. And, and I always remember this, the statement of Sayyidina Umar when he used to say, Kullu nasu minka ya Umar. Everybody knows better than you. And I say this to myself, everyone is better than you. The, why is that? I don't look down at people and then I struggle to become even better. Ya Rabbi Amin. Barakallahu feekum. How, how can we separate culture from religion and do so respectfully? So uh, I, I can answer this question, but are there any questions from the audience people would like to voice or question out public? Uh, brother? Yeah.
جزاك الله خير براذر فيري 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 سترونج كويشن اند ات هايلايتس ذا رياليتي اوف ديفيكولتي ذات ماني اوف اس هاف نوت اونلي ان كوميونيتيز لايك كولومبيا ميزوري بت اولسو ان ديربون ميشيغان وير يو هاف ا لوت اوف مسلمز يو كان ارجيو ذات ذير از ا لوت اوف تشويسز ا لوت اوف اوبورتيونيتيز بت اولسو ذا لاك اوف هافينج ا سيستماتيك واي تو فاسيليتيت ذس حلال انفايرومنت فور بيبل تو كومبليت هاف اوف ذير دين ات ستيل ات ستيل ا تشالنج So, uh, يعني, Dr. Haifa, you want to comment on this? I think there's, 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 it's multifaceted, of course. Number one, I don't remember this incident at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> I remember what his, his sister is an amazing force in the community. I, I haven't seen her in years, but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give her even more. She's a woman, a young woman who stood up for truth. in that room, but I can't say the detail because I have to have her permission. What I will say is what the Rasul alayhi salatu wa salam said, Ya ma'ashar al-sabab tazaw alaykum bil-ba'a fa man lam yisata'a fal yasum. Young men get married. And if you cannot, then fast. So this is number one goes to the parents. When, and I say this to all my friends. When your son comes and now your daughter comes and says, Mom, I want to get married. Get them married. Help them. to get married because otherwise you know what will happen. That's number one. Number two, the communities can help. We have actually in St. Louis, Ya Omar, we do have this now where we have a couple of the sisters, they took the initiative and they actually made a matrimonial committee and they do a, a gathering. And as, as Islam, everything is Islamic way, right? They come in, they, they, the, the singles send their names, men and women, and then they get them together with like a gathering and then they let them meet each other. There's nothing wrong with that because we need to facilitate the halal. We need to help, to, we need to make halal easy because haram is extremely easy. It's everywhere. And we need as a community, as parents, as elderly, as leaders, is to help to make the halal easy. So what I would recommend for all the communities, alhamdulillah, this was, I was not involved in this, as other sisters, and it actually came from sisters. and just to go and do it, and then use the other. There's also Muslim uh, apps these days. Use the Muslim apps. There's nothing wrong with that, because the app is just like introduction. But use it, and take it, and ask Allah for istikhara. He will guide you. Make sure you put the standards that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah make it easy. Jazakumullah khairan Umar. I know he asked us earlier, and he's like, this is something beneficial for everyone to hear about. Uh, I just want to comment on one aspect because it was already answered sufficiently, uh, which is uh, what Dr. Haifat said about the sisters who took initiative. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them. And I, this is just general advice. If you see a gap in your community, if you see a service not being provided, you are the community. Everyone here, you are the community. Any issue you see here, I know, mashallah, you have a small, close-knit community. May Allah bless all of you. Say, Amin. If you see anything that requires some action, some initiative, Take the initiative, bring people together, talk to the people who might know others, who might have uh, connections to the masajid as well. Because traditionally, yeah, people were not sliding into the DMs for you know, 3,000 years. People were meeting uh, through word of mouth, through their families, through their communities. And so if you find that you need something structured, set up here in this community, everyone here, you're here now, you heard this now, take the initiative, inshallah ta'ala. In addition to that, there is nothing wrong with using the matchmaking apps that have expanded people's networks. as long as you're doing so in the right manner. There's nothing wrong with it. And we know so many Muslim couples, happily married, alhamdulillah, who met initially through these uh, different websites. Essentially, you are extending your network out beyond your local community because sometimes that leads to the frustration. And the third thing is, generally speaking, this is a problem everywhere. People are complaining that there's nobody suitable for them in every community, even when you have like 5,000 Muslims, even in Dearborn, Michigan, where we have maybe 150,000 Muslims in the area, it's still a problem. And so you need, of course, as you mentioned, something structured to bring people together, and as well, people not delaying marriage so much, and also people not setting so many conditions on marriage, especially when it comes to their own children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to making the halal easier, so long as, of course, we are being effective and, and wise with it, and protect us from the haram. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khairan for bringing it up. I know that we are at the... You know, nearing the end of time, but I had three questions here that are all related. Is it okay if I answer these? Jazakum khairan. So, somebody asked about LGBTQ, okay, and 
I'm going to be very you know, cautious and calculated in my words. I know we have some youngsters here as well. The question I'm going to use to frame the three questions is, how do you talk about this matter to your children? So it's a very simple, generic question. And I would take a step back and say, like you are teaching your children, hopefully, about everything else of morality. From a young age, don't wait until they're 15 because they already know about it. Don't wait until they're 10. They already know about it. Disney's starting with it way before you started with it. They started when they were three. They started when your kids were two. And I'm not kidding when I say that. That's in discussion right now, and already some things have happened, and you already know this. So if you don't teach your children morality, everyone else will. If you don't teach your children morality, all the movies and TV shows that they are exposed to, if they are exposed to them, will teach them about these matters. In addition to this, I'm going to use a second question connected to the first. The idea that love is just love. And love is between people, what's the big deal with it? Love between people is good. To the one who mentioned this, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, I see where you're coming from. But that's not true. Love between people has limitations. And by that I mean actions. Because if I were to ask the same person who said love between people is good, what about two people who are in happily married uh, lives, they're married separately, different couples, different spouses, and then they started to love one another. Would you say that that is good love? Or would you say, no, that's a bad example? No, these people already have relationships. Extramarital affairs are problematic. Why is it problematic? You held a moral view on this. Like you have a moral view on how you practice intimacy and everything else in terms of the expression of love, so too we are guided in our idea of the practice of love from the one who created us and created our desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create within us a desire for something harmful. Rather, there is something within our environments or our cultures or our times that will cause the fitrah, the natural disposition, to be shifting towards a desire for something else. To have the desire is not prohibited in Islam. To entertain it and then act upon it, frankly, according to all the schools of thought, is prohibited in Islam. And we can't sugarcoat this. Why? Because it's not my opinion. And it's not the opinion of anyone up here. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. And so yes, some people will struggle with this. And there are people who struggle with this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them. It does not expel them from Islam to struggle with that desire. And there are many people who've embraced Islam telling us that they've struggled with that sense of love, but they realize they could not identify as Muslims with a practice that is intimate rather than their religion. Because at the end of the day, the community that you identify with is your religion. You don't identify with a specific practice when it comes to love. In addition to this, we say the idea that love between people is good. How would you define that? And how would you justify that? And I would ask you what I mentioned in the lecture earlier. This is a matter of worldviews. How do you know what you know? At the end of the day, everything that we say of morality has to go back to a reference point. And yes, there are many people who have overcome their struggles. And there are many people who, uh, to reference part of the question here, are happily married, uh, and they are ha happily married in a good way, positive way, uh, meaning something that is permissible. Uh, they struggled for, for many years, and some of them are still struggling. And you can hear about their stories online. You can hear about Muslims who've expressed uh, how they overcame this, or that this is still a jihad for them. It's still striving against their nafs. But at the end of the day, like anyone who has any desire for someone else, regardless of their gender, the action itself could be problematic. The desire itself, they're not held accountable for. And for some people, it may be a long-term trial. Having said that, I would look into uh, a podcast run by somebody who actually is living through this struggle, a Muslim who is married in a halal relationship. Uh, I, I believe it's called Beyond the Rainbow. If somebody here has heard of it, you can correct me if that's wrong. And they have a number of podcasts on this issue, and they are very frank about it. Meaning what? They, they haven't fallen for the uh, secular or liberal talking points that morality is fluid and love is fluid and just love everything because at the end of the day everyone knows if you were to be given some pushback there's a limitation to your claim that all love is good right you can have love for something that is harmful for you if you were to act upon it the same way that some people love certain foods or drinks or alcohol and it may be harmful for them the same way you have people who love someone that they are prohibited from marrying and then in this case you have the specific uh, act that is being referenced here. And again, I'm being very cautious with my words uh, because of the youth. You can ask anyone, regardless of their religions, do they believe there is a limitation 
when it comes to the practice of intimacy. For example, if you were to ask them about something random, let's say bestiality, don't even uh, look into that if you don't know what that is. If you were to ask them, is this something you would find morally reprehensible or permissible? The overwhelming majority of Americans say it's reprehensible. So there's a sense of morality. Why is that reprehensible today? What if in 50 years people are advocating for it? So instead of changing constantly with the, t the tide of people and the shifts that people have when it comes to morality, stick to that which is objective, it is factual, and it is timeless. Our pursuit of truth comes before the pursuit of emotions or the pursuit of people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us guided and firm. Allahumma ameen. With our children, start at a young age. Teach them, teach them about these matters. Talk to them. If you don't, we all know, everyone here who knows, you've heard about everything from somewhere else. If your parents didn't talk to you about any of these matters, you already know about these matters. Kids are exposed to a lot, a lot of things these days and at a very uh, early age. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them as well. Allahumma ameen. Uh, that concludes our Q&A session. Uh, if, if everyone can please join me in giving a round of applause to all of our speakers. <laughs> Inshallah, may Allah bring Baraka uh, success and health to all of you. Inshallah, ameen. And we would love, we're very happy uh, to have you all today with us. Okay, it is now getting close to Maghrib, so we can now begin to make our way outside for uh, prayer, Inshallah. If you need to make wudu, as always, there are bathrooms right outside. And inshallah, we, we plan to pray in about five to ten minutes. Afterwards, we invite everyone to join us downstairs for a complimentary dinner provided by MSO in Stotler 1 through 3. Jazakumullah khairan. Also, one reminder, if you have any children that are being babysitted, please don't forget to pick them up. Jazakumullah khairan.